China and Taiwan. They used to be part of the same country, but ever since the Chinese Civil War, it has been split into two. Mainland China, now under the rule of the CCP, and Taiwan, which was ruled by the nationalists, but ever since has been slowly moving towards a more democratic style of government. And if you're somewhat informed on the geopolitical situation there, it will be no secret that both parties don't exactly see eye to eye with one another, and usually refrain from public diplomatic appearances altogether. Yet, in 1970, for a brief moment in time, both parties would set aside their differences in honor of the funeral of one particular man. And no, he wasn't Chinese, he was a Polish Jewish man who went by the name of Morris Abraham Cohen, better known as Two Gun Cohen. Now how the hell did this guy manage to gain the respect of these two parties who seemed to be at each other's throat for the bigger part of the past century? That's what we're gonna find out today. Welcome back my dear friends and foes, my name is Carlos Art and today we'll be talking about Two Gun Cohen. His story caught my attention after seeing this post on r slash history memes and I just had to look into it. My God, did this guy have a wild story. Morris Abraham Cohen was born in 1887 under the name Mozek Abram Miagin in Ratsanov, Poland. And just two years later, he and his parents moved to England to settle in East London. It was there that the family decided to change their family name to the easier to pronounce Cohen which I currently greatly appreciate. <laughs> Looking into it, Morris seemed like a rowdy kid back in the day. He used to love the streets and the boxing arenas that London had to offer even more than his own school. And at the age of 12, he was arrested as a person suspected of attempting to pick pockets. But after the arrest, he was sent to the Hayes Industrial School, which was an institution set up to care for and train wayward Jewish boys. He spent around five years in the institution, after which his parents shipped him off to Western Canada, hoping that the new world would further help their son find his way in life. And boy, did this guy find his way in life. Morris has had an interesting resume to say the least. He worked at a farm for the first year, after which he started wandering the western provinces of the Canadian country. During this time, he worked as a carnival barker, a gambler, a card shark, which is basically hustling card games, a pickpocket, a pimp, and a real estate broker. What the hell? Well, needless to say that seeing this uh, list of his work experience, <laughs> that uh, Morris has had his run-ins with the law from time to time, most notably for doing the dirty with a girl under the age of 16, of who he was a pimp as well. Yeah. But how do you go from being the precursor of EDP 445 to becoming arguably the most respected Westerner in the entirety of China? Well, Canada has had quite the history of Chinese immigration, mainly in order to get the laborers to construct the Canadian Pacific Railway. And it was with these laborers that Morris grew friendly with. He loved the camaraderie and he loved the food. I mean, don't we all? His friendship even got to the point where he protected a Chinese restaurant owner who was getting robbed, knocking the thief out and throwing his ass out on the pavement. I mean, I don't know if they had any pavement back then, but you get the point. He kicked his ass. And this was something that was unheard of at the time, seeing that it was extremely rare that a white man would come to the aid of a Chinese person. But growing up as a Jew in Europe in the early 1900s, he could feel the struggle of the Chinese community, as he himself was often shunned and looked upon as an outsider. So the Chinese community welcomed Morris with open arms, eventually even recruiting him into the newly formed Revolutionary Alliance, also known as, please forgive me, the Tong Meng Hui led by Dr. Sun Yat-sen, who sought to overthrow the Qing dynasty who were ruling China at the time. And in his time in Canada, Morris kept advocating for Chinese expatriates. Eventually, he got appointed to Commissioner of Oaths in Alberta, where he used his position to help Chinese immigrants becoming naturalized. And it was here where he kind of started his incredible military journey because he started recruiting Chinese immigrants for the Tong Meng Hui. I'm so sorry. He recruited them and trained them to become proficient in musketry, among other things. But then World War I happened. It was the biggest and probably most influential event that has ever happened in human history at that point. And 
With this great war came the strain on the economy in Alberta. The real estate market hit a decline and Morris found himself without any income. But being the jack of all trades he was, he decided to join the Canadian Expeditionary Force, where he became a sergeant and he moved to Camp Sarcy for his training. And it was there where he found infamy among the local newspapers for regularly clashing with the law. One specific event saw him among 12 other soldiers who got charged for disturbing the peace after a tussle with the police. I don't know what that exactly entails, I couldn't find anything about that, but yeah, he got in trouble. But he eventually got acquitted after citing self-defense. And the Calgary Herald reported that Sergeant Cohen showed surprising knowledge of court procedures. I mean, say about the guy all you want, but this guy is clearly very resourceful. During the last part of the war, Cohen served in Europe overseeing the Chinese Labour Corps, who were tasked with support work and manual labour, and eventually he would see action in Belgium during the Third Battle of Ypres. After the war, he resettled in Canada, but seeing that the days of the real estate market boom seemed long gone, Morris set his eyes on a new endeavour. In 1922, he headed out to China and helped close a railway deal for Dr. Sun Yat-sen. And upon arrival in Shanghai, Morris met with George Sokolsky, a journalist from New York who worked with Dr. Sun's English language Shanghai Gazette. It was Sokolsky who arranged an interview for Morris with one of Dr. Sun's associates and he promptly got hired to join the cause. He trained Sun's forces to box and to shoot and how to pick up cupcakes. Oh, I was actually coming out here to pick up a cupcake? Allegedly. Over time, he proved his worth to the Chinese revolutionaries and soon he became one of the main protectors of Dr. Sun, following him to conferences and war zones alike. Clearly a very dangerous job, especially during a revolution. And while protecting Dr. Sun, he eventually got grazed in the arm, which made him think, what would happen if my shooting arm was to get hurt? Well, the solution, more guns. He started carrying a second revolver and found out that he was pretty much ambidextrous. Ambidextrous. Ambidextrous? Ambidextrous ambidextrous and this caught the attention of many westerners as this guy stuck out like a sore thumb among the chinese people this white guy following the revolutionary leader everywhere he went toting his two revolvers at all times it was a bit awe-inspiring a tall tale to be told and it was exceptional it was back then and it still is today and this all eventually led to people throwing out the name Two Gun Cohen, and thus his name was born. He worked for quite a while for Dr. Sun, but eventually Dr. Sun died of cancer, and Cohen went on working for Sun's son, his brother in law, but also for various warlords. He usually ran security for his bosses and acquired weapons and other military supplies, even earning the rank of acting general, even though he never led any troops whatsoever. I mean, this guy literally hustled himself into becoming a general in China. What the actual fuck? But then in 1937, the Japanese Empire invaded China and the Japanese did some very horrible things over there. Cohen immediately stepped up. He was eager to join the fight against the Japanese. He sourced weapons and material for the Chinese and even did some work for the British intelligence agency called Special Operations Executive. It is even said that due to his work, it was proven that the Japanese used poison gas to exterminate the Chinese population. But when in 1941, Hong Kong fell to Japanese, Tu Gun Cohen got imprisoned at Stanley internment camp. It was there where he would be badly beaten and held captive until the late 1943, where he was part of a prisoner exchange because he still had his Canadian citizenship. After which he got back to Montreal, he got married and settled down. Wait, wait, no, 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 he didn't. He frequently kept traveling to China to establish business relationships and to visit old friends. But when in 1947, the newly formed UN was voting on the resolution of the partition of Palestine, Morris flew out to San Francisco and convinced the Chinese delegation to abstain from voting when he found out that they were actually opposed to partition. I think it's mind-boggling that this one Polish dude held so much sway over these Chinese diplomats. Even further compounding this is the fact that Morris was one of the few people that would still be able to travel between China and Taiwan following the communist takeover in 1949. 
as both parties greatly respected him for being a loyal aide to Dr. Sun Yat-sen. Needless to say, Morris was often away from home and this resulted in his marriage failing. He eventually did settle down with his sisters in Salford, England and was surrounded by siblings, nephews and nieces altogether. Since he was viewed as a loyal aide to Sun Yat-sen, the father of the Chinese Revolution, he was able to maintain good relations with both the Kuomintang and the Chinese communist leaders, which allowed him to obtain consulting jobs for various British corporations who were eager to explore the Chinese market, but this time without opium. Morris Abraham Cohen would eventually pass away in 1970 at the ripe age of 83, and it was at his funeral that both Chinese and Taiwanese officials made a rare public appearance together. Even when both parties didn't recognize each other's existence and legitimacy, they couldn't ignore the passing of their old ally, Tugun Cohen. And that's how a Polish-born Jewish boy raised in the slums of East London eventually became one of, if not the most respected Westerner in at least recent Chinese history. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Uh, let me know in the comments if you like this type of video. I mean, history is full of colorful figures like this and I think there's a lot more to explore in that regard. Oh yeah, and perhaps consider subscribing, maybe, perhaps, I don't know, maybe like, I don't know. Yeah, you do your thing, okay, bye.